Namada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashikyate That Brahman is infinite and this universe is infinite. The infinite proceeds from the infinite. Then, taking the infinitude of the infinite universe, it remains as the infinite Brahman alone. Namaste. One of my favorite shlokams from the Upanishads. This one is the introduction or invocation to the Isha Upanishad and also many other Upanishads, including one very interesting but obscure Upanishad called the Turiya Tita Avadhuta Upanishad. And we're going to talk about Turiya Tita here, along with many other ontological categories that are behind the model that we're using to explain the Upanishads. So, let's take a look again at the opening of this video. And we see that in the background of the shlokam, the one Brahman becomes two. Now, how does Brahman become two? <laughs> because Brahman is always one. Brahman is never divided. It never has any boundaries or differences in it. It never changes. Yet, we see that it becomes divided into the superior Brahman, Shiva, and the inferior Brahman, or Shiva, or Shakti. Shakti accepts Upadis, and that is how everything else is produced. So let's take a look at how that develops. From the Nirguna Brahman, Shiva, the Saguna Brahman, Shiva, or Shakti, emanates. And the consciousness of the Nirguna Brahman, or Shiva, is called Turiya Tita. And its object is Turiya alone. Now, Turiya and the realm of the Nirguna Brahman is unconditioned. But the realm of Shakti, or Shiva, is the conditioned. And she accepts upadis. These upadis give rise to the conditioned states of consciousness. Jagrat, which is conducted by the Rajaguna, the mode of passion, or Lord Brahma. Svapna, which is Sattvaguna, which is conducted by Lord Vishnu. And Sushupti, the Tamoguna, which is conducted by Shiva, or actually Rudra in the material universe. So these are the basic ontological categories that give rise to the states of conditioned consciousness. And of course, from them, all the other objects arise. And we've gone over this before, but I want to do it again. Even though in the last video we talked about the different states of consciousness, we did it from the bottom up. But here, I'd like to do it from the top down. So, at first we have Turiya, Transcendental Consciousness. Its object is the inferior Brahman, Shakti. And its view is Ajatavada, the world is unborn. The Yoga is Jnana Yoga, or Self-Realization, and its destination, well, it is the destination. So, Aham Brahmasmi. Then, in Sushupti, what we experience often as deep sleep, the object is shunyata, emptiness. The view is vivartavada, the world is illusion. The yoga is raja yoga, or meditation. And the destination is self-realization, or liberation. Then there's svapna, which is dreaming. And in that consciousness, the object is the mind and thoughts. The view is called Vishishta Dvaitavada, or qualified non-duality. The yoga is Bhakti Yoga, the yoga of devotion. 
and its destination is the higher heaven or Vaikunta, that part of the creation which continues without interruption for the entire existence of the universe. Finally, we have Jagrat, or waking consciousness, whose object is the things in the world, and the view is Dvaitavada, or duality. The yoga is karma yoga, religious sacrifice, and its destination is the lower heaven, or the temporary heavenly planets, or a pious human birth in the next life. So, now, how do all of these relate, and how do we experience them, most importantly? Well, the point of all of this is to have a background that describes our experience, especially our experience in self-realization or meditation. So, when we begin on the path, we usually begin at the very lowest stage of the religious sacrifices. And these have to be done with a view for attaining a permanent identity, a permanent goal of life, a permanent state of being. Because in the current life, obviously, everything is impermanent. That's because we are obsessed with, attached to, the lower state of consciousness, duality, in which the body seems to be the self, the objects of the senses appear to be real. Material cause and effect, karma, appears to be the operative principle of everything, and so on. So, to rise above this, we reach to the platform of the mind, and we engage thoughts in contemplation of the Supreme. Now, because of our background, because of our conditioning, we conceive the Supreme as Brahman plus Upadis. And that's what the meaning of Vishishta Dvaita Vada is, that the Supreme Brahman becomes covered by the Upadi of Ishatvam. Ishatvam means the personality of Godhead. And the living entities, ourselves, become covered by the Upadi of Jivatvam, those who are born who are in samsara. So, by definition, the Supreme is beyond samsara. The Supreme is always liberated. He's not subject to ignorance, even though he allows himself to be covered by the upadi of Ishatvam. He is not affected by it. That's the definition of the Supreme. And both Shiva and Shiva, both the male deities like Vishnu and their female counterparts like Lakshmi, Mahalakshmi, are not affected by their upadis. They always retain their initial status or consciousness as Brahman. So that's the meaning of God. God is that being who is not affected by the conditioning of the upadis, even though they may utilize them. So, if we perform bhakti very nicely and reach the spontaneous stage of pure love, that spontaneously brings us to meditation. And in meditation, the process is neti neti. Not this, not this, not this. Rejecting everything perceived in order to realize the perceiver. So, functionally or experientially, what happens is that we eventually find ourselves in the void, sushupti. And sushupti, shunyata, emptiness, is where there is nothing to perceive. Yet, we remain aware and awake. This is what the Buddha taught. This is his nibbana, nirvana. That state where there is nothing to be experienced or felt. Complete freedom from suffering. This is very nice. And if we remain in this state, eventually what happens is the spontaneous realization of the complete Brahman, the unconditioned Brahman, the supreme Brahman. Either the secondary Brahman, superior or inferior Brahman, both are good, both can be realized through the process that we are studying in this Katha Upanishad. 
So we'll get to that in the next chapter when death begins to advise or instruct Nachiketa on how to attain all these wonderful and high states. So now I want to talk a little bit about my experience. This is not just theory, at least for me. This is all experiential. I went through each one of these stages, did the process, and got the result over, what is it now, 76 years of experience. And beginning very early in life, I performed religious sacrifice, and then I developed love of God, and then I practiced meditation, and finally I got the realization. So these four stages are not just theory. They are the experience of anyone who sincerely treads the path, who does all the practices, follows all the scriptures, but importantly, who does not get distracted by organizations and their restrictions and their limitations. One should remain independent. Now, I have engaged with organizations. I have been a member of various spiritual organizations. And in every case, I outgrew them. And I had to go searching independently. Why? Because organizations always impose their own upadis, their own limitations. They say, oh, you can do this, but you can't do that. You can think like this, but you can't think like that. You can be this, you can play this role, but you can't play these other roles, and so on. So, of course, to someone who wants to achieve complete freedom, these restrictions are intolerable. Right? So... Ultimately, although we may gain from the help and context provided by religious organizations, we have to be situated in our own self and willing to take full responsibility for learning and realizing all the stages on the path. And this is what will bring us to full self-realization. This is what will bring us to these higher states of consciousness. And one more point, all these states are experienced simultaneously. In other words, even the most staunch atheistic materialist who is totally obsessed with Dvaitavada, the material view, is actually in Turiya, or he wouldn't be aware at all. The lower states of consciousness, the conditioned states of consciousness, Jagra, Svapna, and Sushupti, are simply Turiya covered by Upadis. So when we see this, we realize that, whoa, I've been enlightened all along. I've been in this pure consciousness all along. I've been in Ajatavada. The world has been unborn all along. It was always an illusion. And this is the attractiveness of the example of the rope and the snake. One realizes the world is like the snake. It's a covering. It's a projection. It's an overlay. It's a superimposition on the rope. And we make that superimposition by dreaming about name and form and so on, and thinking that that's reality. But when we transcend that, and we see through the illusion, we see behind the curtain, uh, behind the veil, and we realize that we have been in Turiya all along. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.